The Daytona 500, the great American race, the Super Bowl of auto racing. It's a race that every driver wants to win that enters in, every NASCAR driver dreams of winning, and it's one that has tons and tons of what ifs. So today, what I want to look at are the 10 greatest what ifs in Daytona 500 history. Starting out, we're going to look at the start of the decade with 2020 and ask what happens if Ryan Newman doesn't wreck at the end of the race. You see, the first way that this could have not happened is that Ryan Newman basically is not involved in anything whatsoever as the caution is thrown for Chase Elliott wrecking on the front stretch into the field but not being touched. Yes, it would be an anticlimactic way of ending the race, but ultimately we avoid disaster. Now, secondly, let's say he doesn't spin. Let's say he gets loose or spins down to the bottom or is slowed up. Well, Blaney and Hamlin probably have a legendary finish still, as in the actual running, before the caution was flown, they had an amazing side-by-side -side run. Or third, maybe he performed better altogether and won the Daytona 500, and maybe is still even racing in the NASCAR Cup Series today, as he doesn't have an injury that hampers his abilities. Next, we'll go back to another election cycle in 2016 and say what happens if Matt Kenseth doesn't throw the overaggressive block on Denny Hamlin. Kenseth seemed on his way to winning a third Daytona 500 in 2016, but his teammate Denny Hamlin had other ideas charging through the pack. Kenseth throws a block and fails miserably. See, I still think Denny Hamlin is going to race to the win on this one, but I still also think we're going to get a legendary side-by-side -side finish, and Matt Kenseth has a shot at winning this race instead of fading back into the pack after making a pretty amazing save. Now, 2011. That one is an interesting one. It has a little to do with winner Trevor Bain, but it's what if David Reagan doesn't jump down early on what would have been the final restart. See, he worked in a tandem with the two-car tango with Trevor Bain all day. The two were a great pairing and ultimately were one of the best up there because they just avoided all the wrecks, worked together perfectly, and on a final restart, well, they had it perfected, just not enough. They had it perfected too early as David Reagan changed lanes before they got to the finish line. So I'm saying, I honestly think the race comes down to the 6 and the 21. And maybe Trevor Bain wins it in a really good side-by-side -side finish. Or maybe David Reagan just has what it takes to win. And he is remembered as the 2011 Daytona 500 champion. Now, going back to 2010, let's go back to what I think is the highlight of the season for me as a Dale Jr. fan and ask, what happens if Dale Jr. doesn't get squirreled up while going three wide? Dale Jr. had restarted 10th with two to go. He was the fastest down the backstretch all day, and in his hard charge from 10th to 2nd, he made an amazing three wide move up the middle that ultimately gave him a shot at winning. But in doing so, he got a little loose. The cars were very hard to handle in this race, and Junior almost had to save it from wrecking because of how aggressive the move was. But let's say he doesn't go a little over, he doesn't wiggle, and he uses that run that he had to almost get to McMurray's bumper to actually get beside him. Well, if the 88 car gets beside the one with how prevalent the side draft was, it is very likely that Dale Jr. can slingshot himself by McMurray and be the 2010 Daytona 500 champion. Now back to the first COT Daytona 500, let's ask what happens if Stewart tries to block Ryan Newman. Tony Stewart never won a Daytona 500 in his career, but the closest he came was 2008 when he led at the white flag and led onto the backstretch. But he decided to drop low and draft with teammate Kyle Busch, who did not have any momentum and Stewart stalled out halfway down the backstretch giving the opportunity to Ryan Newman and Kurt Busch, the Penske duo, to go 1-2. But if Tony Stewart stays high, I think the 2 and the 12 still work together and try and pass. But with how aggressive Stewart would be in that moment, it also might cause a giant wreck, and we might see somebody out of the pack win the 500. Now, from a heartbreaking loss to a many see as a heartbreaking blunder, what if Sterling Marlin doesn't get out of his car and try and pry the bumper in the red flag? You see, with Marlon doing this, he forever was etched in NASCAR history and Daytona 500 history 
for being the guy dumb enough to get out of a car and try and work on it right behind the pace car in front of about 15 million people watching on TV. He got penalized out of the lead for this and while he recovered a bit, did not get to the front by the end. Now, a lot of people remember this for him doing something stupid and how do you throw away your shot at the Daytona 500? But the damage he had meant that the front fender was rubbing against the front tire. So either way, he's gonna have to lose the lead just not in his dumb way. I think that many people don't remember Marlon for this move as much, and maybe even remember him a bit better for his successes if he doesn't do this move. Now going back to the 90s, we go to 1998, the 50th season of NASCAR. And let's ask a question that I don't think many would want to ask. What happens if there's not a caution with two to go in that race? If many remember, it's not Dale Earnhardt comes to the checkered flag, it's Dale Earnhardt comes to the caution flag to win the Daytona 500. And Earnhardt had some luck, as with that race going from a lap and a half to go to just half a lap to go, coming off four, there was a lap car that he could use as a pick to slow up the pack behind him. But let's say that that's just coming to the white flag. They still have to race one more time around. Well, Bobby Labonte or Jeremy Mayfield would probably have a shot at three. And Dale may end up going winless in the Daytona 500 in his career or have another heartbreaking loss. Say he pulls a block and ends up getting spun off the 12 or the 18. Those very well could happen and we could have missed out on one of, if not the greatest moment in NASCAR's illustrious run. From the tail end of the decade to the start of it, 1990 was another Dale Earnhardt-centered moment. But let's say Dale Earnhardt's tire stays inflated through three and four in that race. See, with Dale Earnhardt's flat tire, it gave Derek Cope the ability to win the Daytona 500 in a pretty amazing underdog story. But if there's not a flat tire with how good Earnhardt was that day, I say the Intimidator cruises to victory in 1990. We don't get one of these giant storylines like we had of 20 years of trying. Instead, he just wins after 17 years of trying happened the year before. And in this, Derek Cope would not be as prevalent today or probably remembered whatsoever. And he would probably honestly just be remembered for being a one hit wonder later in the season at Dover. Now with the last two options on this video, we're going to go to two historical landmarks in the race's history, starting with 1979, and ask, what if the fight doesn't happen? What if everybody just says, hey, Robin's racing, it happens, we'll get him next year, and walks off with arms over their shoulders into the ambulance or into a car or into whatever was going to take them to the infield, and they just say, bygones be bygones. Well, I think with the fight, it was so huge in pushing NASCAR to the general public audience that we see a huge difference long term. Maybe many people just turn off the race. Oh, it was somewhat entertaining, something to do while we're snowed in, but that's about it. And you don't make generational NASCAR fans out of it. The 1979 Daytona 500 didn't immediately put NASCAR into the top five or even top 10 of most popular sports leagues, but it started it on that trajectory. And you may have seen a smaller burn, maybe a bigger flare up or a smaller flare up and NASCAR never reaches the heights that it actually did without this race happening. And lastly, we go back to the very beginning with the inaugural Daytona 500 and ask, what if there wasn't a photo finish? There was a three wide finish with two cars being in contention to win the inaugural Daytona 500. And it cost NASCAR three days of saying they didn't know who the winner was when they did to get tons of drama and intrigue about the winner of this race until a photo came forward. A photo that is still famous today. And if this doesn't happen, well, we may have a different tone for the Daytona 500. Well, then we may be seeing the Daytona 500 just be another race or maybe a crown jewel, but not on the level it's at today. Now with that, I want to pass this all on to you and ask, what are your biggest Daytona 500 what ifs? Let me know down in the comments below. And while you're at it, leave a like on this video, share this video, and subscribe to my channel for more great NASCAR content. Thank you so much to all my channel members for your continued support. And also, be sure to watch the NASCAR Weekly Podcast tomorrow night at 8 p.m. Eastern Time on this channel. So until next time, have a good one.